This is the Regain Wellness Podcast with Jamie Logie, episode 146. Is the Whole30 Diet Effective? Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Jamie Logie. I run RegainWellness.com and this is the Regain Wellness Podcast of the same name and kicking it off with, of course, the theme to Webster. I'm trying to throw in as many random 80s TV theme songs as I can at the start of the show. Hopefully you remember this one. So this episode is about probably the most, I don't know, I, I guess popular and relevant diet or movement nutrition movement at the moment the whole 30 diet so it's it pops up on a lot of you always see these end of the year lists that show up on you know things like cnn or whatever they talk about what are the most effective diets or approaches diets a bad word in general i'll get to that in a minute but approaches and this year there was a lot of sort of dismissal of the ketogenic diet and Whole30 has popped up on a lot of these things as seen to be effective, maybe not the most effective. So this whole show will be what Whole30 is, uh, how it works, the approach, kind of my take on it, pros and cons, the whole deal. So hopefully you'll learn all about it. Or if you've already been doing it, it's maybe a refresher and you'll learn a few new things about it. So before I start, make sure you subscribe to the podcast, wherever you get your podcasts, whether it's the podcast fairy or Apple podcasts, iTunes, Google play down the street, around the corner, wherever you get them, I should be there. So make sure to subscribe so that way you get the show automatically sent to you each week. Okay. That's out of the way. Let's go. So whole 30 is interesting because it's kind of got its roots in social media and as far as how it kind of got pushed into the mainstream, how it got promoted. If you're not on, it depends kind of your demographic of where you're coming from. If you're listening to this, if you're in your early twenties, you might be more on board with it. If you're older, you don't use things like Instagram. It might be a little foreign, but just think like Instagram's a very interesting place where There's so much, you hear the term like social media influencers, and it's probably no bigger than it is on Instagram because of the amount of people who are devoted to fitness, whether they're fitness models or people who've had amazing transformation journeys. And it's a completely visual medium. It's just one shot. You can put a lot of, you know, captions and posts and quotes and, you know, influential whatever in your post. But I mean, it's, it's primarily completely visual and you see amazing physiques and bodies and conditions. And obviously there's a little that goes behind that as far as, you know, not just from filter usage, but lighting, camera angles, body position angles. So, I mean, it can be a little misleading, but the main thing is it, there's such a huge kind of avalanche of these massive influencers who have built entire careers just off Instagram and and people you've never heard of before but who have millions of followers and like I'm there's the first one's coming to mind maybe just cuz I was scrolling through Instagram is a girl named Katie Hearn and she's I mean whatever she just showed her normal fitness journey starting years and years ago on Instagram and you know develops this good physique she's probably It's kind of unfortunate, but a lot of these influencers are known more for their uh, glute development as much as anything and booty building programs and whatever. If that's something people want, that's cool and that works for them. So say in her example, she, you know, has a noticeable (laughs) glute development and showcased that a lot. And then she started kind of connecting and sharing tips. And then that evolved into her doing these like booty building programs that were 
two or three weeks. And then that evolved into more and more followers to the point she's, you know, past a million or whatever. And four times a year, they do this fitness challenge thing where it's all done online and people share all their posts and info through Instagram and through different hashtags. They own her and her husband own their own like huge gym. They own a meal service, like meal delivery service called Bite Meals. They just launched an entire supplement product line. This is all off Instagram and just pictures that started going up and the whole thing builds over that. And there's a million examples of people like this that build it. If you look up the big hashtags like Fitspo and FitFam and InstaFit and just stuff like that. And there's just this whole kind of movement and network of all these people. And this is where things are spreading because people want to post what they're doing. They want to share with each other. And this is kind of the deal with Whole30. So it starts by a woman named Melissa Hartwig back in 2009. And she's actually a sports nutritionist. So coming from a good background, it's one of the problems a lot of these online influencers and that become coaches and big, so, uh, you know, kind of leading potential movements that are fit and strong and look good, but have absolutely no background and maybe shouldn't be kind of leading people through workouts or, you know, not considering, I don't know. They just, they don't have any knowledge and the good ones though will educate themselves or they'll at least expand their understanding of things by getting, I don't know, personal training certifications or trying to get into nutrition programs, but a lot don't have to. Like when you have 6 million followers, it, it's like the Kardashian um, effect that anything you put up, people are going to jump on board with just because they see you doing it. So, I mean, ideally these, I mean, sorry, optimally these people are leading people towards more of a healthier lifestyle. So that's good. But then, there, you know, there's little complications that can come. So with Melissa Hartwig, she's an actual sports nutritionist. So if you in the New York Times in July 2016, they had an article up and it was talking about this whole thing I just mentioned about Instagram and the use of Instagram by dieters and people. And they noted that participants in the Whole30 program had shared over 1 million Instagram posts using the hashtag Whole30 hashtag. And it just had grown from there. Like I said, there's so many of these different like movements and communities that you've never, ever seen, but they have such a raving fan base. It's nuts. And so this had been going on, obviously, for a little while, and the people who knew it knew it well. And then this New York Times article comes up, and it noted that the that those that were sharing the tag were part of these, you know, endless like-minded communities. And, you know, probably the biggest over the years, which is still relevant on social media, is Weight Watchers. And they've, you know, had really good exposure as far as commercials and everyone knows Weight Watchers. Like they've made their brand very well known. And that's still a big thing on Instagram and just hashtag Weight Watchers. They have, you know, at the time in 2016 with this article, they had, there was over 3.5 million posts, which is pretty amazing. But the, you know, Whole30 is doing pretty well with a million. So what was and is the Whole30 diet plan. So I'll get in this right now. Diet is such a bad word to use because the concept of diet, it kind of, it insinuates restriction and cutting stuff out and depriving yourself. And that's what, when people think of a diet, that's what they think they got, they can't eat. They got to take all this stuff away. Calories have to go way down. They can't enjoy anything. So it's a very bad approach. So the problem is that term is still used even when it's in conjunction with a kind of a, a movement or a, you know, healthy eating mindset, or, you know, like we talk about the Mediterranean diet or the paleo diet or the ketogenic diet and that, you know, when I'm saying diet now, I'm referring to the approach as opposed to the restriction, you know, so, so diet in general is just not, you know, conducive to, you know, an ideal healthy movement, but you know, in the case of Whole30, it just kind of rolls off the tongue, the Whole30 diet. So when I'm saying it like that, I'm just referring to the the approach. So with Whole30, it's a 30-day here diet, you know, that emphasizes whole foods. And during this, the whoever's, you know, participating, you eliminate sugar, 
You eliminate alcohol, grains, legumes, soy, and dairy. And it's, you know, on the surface, it's kind of like a paleo diet because essentially that's what paleo is, is eating foods that our paleolithic ancestors would have had, you know, that ended around 10,000 years ago or when the agriculture age started, when we started domesticating grains and weed and then, you know, getting into, you know, rice or potatoes or whatever, like stuff like that. Those starches really never existed. And, you know, the primary focus would have been on proteins, healthy fats, vegetables, some fruits and whatever. So on the, you know, on the surface, it's kind of like that, but even more restrictive than paleo as, as the people who are doing it, you're not even allowed natural sweeteners like honey or maple syrup, which I think is interesting because our, you know, our Paleolithic ancestors, they wouldn't have eaten a lot of sweet stuff because fruit as they knew it is completely different than our fruit today. Our fruit has been so hybridized and evolved and that that's different than, you know, genetically modified foods, which is a whole other thing, but that's kind of thrown in the mix too. But we've been able to breed out traits we don't like from fruits and make them bigger and juicier and stuff like that. Like when's the last time you had any, like a grape that had seeds in it, you know, and or even watermelons, they just seeds don't exist because we've been able to naturally take those traits away. It's the same thing with like dog breeding. You can breed out certain things and cross over things. And we've been able to do it with fruit in, in still a natural way. Like farmers have been doing this for centuries and centuries and fruit now as we have, it would be almost unrecognizable to a paleolithic ancestor because it's just too big and too sweet. And fruit, you know, originally would have been more bitter. It would have been very fibrous. Um, if you look at something like a banana, bananas originated in Southeast Asia and they were shorter they were thicker, they were way starchier, and they were so full of seeds that you'd probably find them in- inedible compared to our modern day bananas, which are brighter and sweeter and softer and fleshier. And all those things have kind of changed over the time. So first, you know, if you've ever eaten a, like a sort of sour cooking apple or green apple or berries that are sort of that bitter sour astringent sort of taste that's more what fruit is in its natural state and that's how we would have consumed it and we would only had access to it for a very short period of time each year when the fruit was ripened so we didn't have access to fruit year round from all over the place all at once and you know so so we did have those things in that and we would have had honey as well but again only for that short little window we maybe would have consumed actual honeycomb and depending on you know the location and wherever. So those are things, I mean, if you're being a strict paleo uh, follower, you'd still be able to have here and there, like, you know, maple syrup's natural and it, it happens at certain times and whatever. But with the Whole30 diet, those things are excluded. So it's considered a little more restrictive. So its main focus is then obviously on meat and then you've got nuts and seeds, seafood, there's eggs, and again, then vegetables and fruit. And during this whole 30, so over the course of 30 days where you've eliminated all those things and you focused on what I just mentioned, the participants are advised not to count calories or even weigh yourself. You're like, you have to like throw your scale out. Don't look at it. Don't, you know, you don't want to see where you are day to day. It's about this whole block of 30 days and having this, you know, ideally turnaround. So after the program is complete, like you know, participants are counseled to strategically reintroduce, reintroduce foods outside of that endorsed you know list of things I said, like the meat, nuts, seeds, seafood, so forth. Um, and then, once you introduce those foods back in, document the health consequences and you know kind of the culinary value of those additions, and then determine if it's something you want to keep in your diet or not. And the the people of this Melissa Hartwig and I think there's another I don't know if this was a a relative or I think there's a guy named Dallas Hartwig too who was involved, but they believe that sugars, grains, dairy, alcohol, and legumes affect weight, energy, and stress levels. And I would totally agree with that. And what we're looking at here is basically an elimination diet, which is something that's been very big with 
any, you know, dietitians, nutritionists, whoever. And it's been a thing <clears throat> kind of always around where you eliminate, usually the big three are going to be like gluten or wheat, um, things like dairy, and then, you know, maybe like soy and sugar or whatever. And then, you know, so you eliminate those for at least two weeks and then you slowly add them back in. So you've eliminated them all. And then, you know, after two weeks, you start having gluten or wheat again for three days and then see how that feels. And then, you know, maybe add eggs back in. And this is sort of to, to identify food allergies and it's a good way to do it. So with Whole30, it's kind of a bigger approach to that where you're completely cutting them out, but then they are reintroduced back in and then you kind of have a look at how your body, you know, sort of handles these things, whether it's alcohol or legumes or whatever. So you sort of notice. So I like, and that approach, it's, it's very good because if you're constantly say eating these foods that are, are causing you um, to feel run down or affecting your mood or affecting your energy. If you're like this all the time, you don't know any different. And then when you eliminate them and add them back in, you're like, Oh crap, that's actually what's causing it. And more often than not, I mean, sugar is going to be at the top of the list and that can be removed all the time. You're still obviously going to have sugar. It's still going to happen. But if you just don't have it in the quantities you did before, same thing with grains, whether you believe gluten sensitivity is a real thing or not, people still do react to it. If you have a problem with gluten, you're already going to know it and you're either diagnosed celiac or it's caused huge digestive problems or even like skin issues or joint pain or whatever it may be. Those two are usually big at the top and along with dairy. When you add them back in, people start seeing same thing. Like with dairy, they'll see inflammation in their body and, um, like congestion and again, skin problems and stuff like that. So they're not too hard to identify. So with this, you're taking them all out and then having a look to see how they affect and not, not just like your weight, but you know, all those things, stress levels, energy and what have you. So when you look on the whole 30 website, so whole 30.com, this is really what they're pushing is to kind of give your body a reset, take that 30 days and, you know, eliminate all those things and try to basically heal it. And that, you know, these next 30 days can change your life, <clears throat> can change the way you think about food, even change your taste buds. You know, if you're eating a lot of processed and manufactured crap, you kind of lose the idea of real flavor and food and it kind of brings that back and ideally helps you to create more of a relationship with real food and more of a desire for actual real food. So they're also saying, you know, like I mentioned, all the things to eat, the seafood, eggs, meat, lots of vegetables, some fruit, um, natural fats, lots of herbs, spices, seasonings, and, you know, eating things with as minimal ingredients as possible. And if, you know, if ideally just eating real whole foods all the time and, when they talk about what else is avoided, you know, no added sugar, real artificial. So besides the maple syrup and honey, you've got like agave nectar, avoiding coconut sugar, dates, date syrup, even stevia, splenda, any of the artificial sweeteners, no alcohol, not even for cooking, obviously no tobacco, all the grains, anything that's a grain, like they actually go into depth because some people, you know, might not be aware. It's not just wheat, rye, and barley. It goes past that into oats, corn, rice, millet, sprouted grains, gluten-free things, even quinoa, everything. So, I mean, you can see it, like any form of starch like that. Then in the legumes, all the different beans, like black, red, pinto, navy, white, kidney, lima, the whole deal, peas, chickpeas, lentils. You know, usually cons what people consider healthy stuff, but no peanut butter, no forms of soy, no soy sauce, miso, tofu, edamame, sorry, sushi lovers, um, you know, any any of these legumes that, you know, some people do have problems with. Uh, dairy, obviously, is going to be cow, goat, or sheep's milk. That's usually easy to identify. Uh, then getting rid of the, you know, MSGs, uh, you know, any processed food stuff no baked foods. So there's quite a lot. And then, you know, along with it, you're eating all these natural, real whole foods and they, it, there's a few things that are included. So you can have 
ghee or clarified butter, which is the only source of dairy apparently that's allowed in the Whole30 diet. Um, plain butter is not, but the milk proteins found in non clarified butter are a little different. So like as far as the, the process and whatever. So if you've ever had ghee before, it is, it's kind of, it's hard to describe without tasting it, but it is a different substance than butter. You can actually have um, fruit juice. So like they say, some products or recipes will include fruit juice as a standalone ingredient or natural sweetener, which under whole 30 is fine, which is one of the things I would disagree with because it talks about having real whole food and fruit juice is not real. We're not meant to consume fruit juice in this isolated, refined state, which it needs to be in its original packaging. It needs to have the fiber and, you know, the starch and, and whatever that slows the absorption down that you get. Like when you eat an apple, there's still natural fruit, you know, juice and fructose and whatever, but because of the pectins and the, you know, fiber and whatever, it's a slow release. When you have straight fruit juice, it shoots your blood sugar up within two seconds. If you have a glass of orange juice, you can noticeably measure your blood sugar going up within two seconds. So that one's really surprising to me because it's not a paleolithic diet, but it sort of has its roots in that. And our ancestors would never consume fruit juice. I mean, they might have squeezed things out, but they still would have consumed the whole fruit. It does allow, the list of legumes is pretty big, like I mentioned, but there's a few ones that you're allowed, like green beans, uh, sugar snap peas and even and just normal snow peas are allowed and more because they're not technically a legume they're more of a pod than a bean so and again they're like they're they're greens they are they are good for you um vinegar is allowed which i think that's cool because vinegar is a amazing thing and any sort of fermented product because of its ability to help like you know digestion and they can act as like prebiotics, say like apple cider vinegar and, and good for, um, you know, uh, circulation, like digestion, absorption, all that sort of thing. So red wine vinegar, balsamic vinegar, they're all allowed. You can't have malt vinegar because that does have gluten in it because it's um, made from malted um, grains. Then you've got, you can do some salt actually, and it's actually courage because you need some of that sodium. You might not be getting it from other sources. And ideally it's going to be a natural, like a Himalayan salt, like a pink salt or a sea salt, just because it has more of that trace mineral content. So whole 30 is tough and they lay it right out in the whole program and not even necessarily a program, it, it, more of a, a dietary approach. So the whole idea is that your job during these 30 days is to focus on making the best food choices. And this is what it does. It helps sort of train you to think about what you're going for and make decisions or have the best option in any given circumstance. So you're not weighing things. You're not measuring. You're not counting calories. You don't have to purchase everything, you know, like the Weight Watchers meals. And they sometimes have those, you know, point system things. It's it doesn't have to be all organic or grass fed stuff. It's just about sticking with it and, you know, do it like for the 30 days, it's tough, even with like special circumstances or events and avoiding those. And you're not supposed to cheat. You're not supposed to slip up. No special occasions. If there's a birthday, you're not having the cake. It is tough. And they say it straight up. It's not, you know, about you know punishing people it's about making them having to play the tough guy unquote to keep you on track and because it is that elimination diet so if you're going well for 10 days but then you add that thing back in you basically have to start over again you know because it hasn't been truly eliminated so you're better off just doing that full 30 days <clears throat> instead of having to start stop start stop or whatever and any of those things like the gluten or the sugar they're inflammatory foods and they're going to throw off what they call the healing cycle kind of getting your body to reset and then you know say in the case of sugar it's going to start that craving effect again it's going to mess with your blood sugar then you're going to want more of it and then you know it's easy to slip up anytime we crave something if you're sitting somewhere 
and all of a sudden you want chocolate or chocolate cake or cookies, whatever. That's your brain wanting that stuff because you've sort of thrown it back into the mix again. And you cannot willpower people, you know, look down on that, but you're, you're fighting against body chemistry at that. It's not willpower. It's <clears throat> this ancient brain that has been <clears throat> evolved and grown to crave these certain things and can be hijacked by in- inferior foods or hyper palatable stuff like these sugars and these refined carbs that never existed before that are basically like drugs in us. And you just, you cannot fight your brain and the cravings of that. So if you do slip up over this course, it's considered to throw off the whole thing. So it's very hard. You have to be committed, sorry, com- com- committed, committed to the 30 days exactly as it is, exactly as it is and as written a hundred percent. Or you won't get the benefits from it. And they're, you know, straight up when they say that. They even get a little harsh in it too, where they talk about that this is not hard and don't you dare tell us this is hard. And, you know, I can appreciate that sort of tough love thing. They talk about other life circumstances that are are much harder. And I agree with that. And then they also, you know, say like before, don't even consider the possibility of a slip um, unless you... <laughs> physically tripped and face landed in pizza, there's no slip. You make a choice, good or un, you know, good or bad. Then it just, you know, goes in that it's going to require effort. You got to plan stuff. You got to grocery shop perfectly. If you're dining out, you got to take that in consideration. If you're going to family events, if there's stress going on, it takes a lot of work. I mean, being healthy is not easy. If it was, everyone would be perfectly fit. It takes work. But they do say you can do this. You've come this far. Um, you want to do this, you need to do this, and you know that you can do this. So, you know, kind of cracking the whip here, but realizing what this is all about. So that's the whole thing in a nutshell. And my two cents is ultimately, I think it's good. I think as far as these, and like, again, hating using the word diet, but, and even fad, it, it's kind of chalked up to that a bit. Whenever you see something that's on you know, news shows or you read them on the Huffington Post or you see them on magazines. Do people even read magazines anymore? Whatever, it's like a little more in the mix or there's more books out there. It's inadvertently gets promoted as a fad because there's sort of hype behind it. And that can be to its own detriment. But, you know, if it's getting people to make healthy choices, ultimately it's good. So in my mind, there's there's people that really don't like this thing. And I understand where they're coming from there. Some of these you'll see dietitians that say we want behavioral changes and dietary changes that are slow and progressive. And then they're meaningful. There's say like the grouping, you know, some people said the grouping of banned foods is both, you know, kind of random or bizarre from a nutrition perspective. Um, you know, if the idea is good nutrition, then cutting out whole grains and legumes is at odds with what a lot of other, information says there's some things that say whole grains are good and legumes can be amazing for your health and it's been you know years ago it was even regarded as one as one of the worst worst health trends so there's a lot of naysayers against it and to me though the more i looked into it like it's kind of my you know my job to be aware of different diets and be up to speed with stuff and it was one of those things that i thought i was like ah this is this is not a far it's far from a scam but to me it seemed a little more like a sort of tabloid magazine type diet that you'd see like try this because megan fox is doing it or whatever but the more i looked into it i actually do like the idea behind it and i think first eliminating foods to see actually how they impact your body is very important i think everyone should do this at one point if you're ever concerned about you know how you're feeling or you're feeling run down energy levels even mood and stuff like that it can come down to your diet in a lot of cases it does and when you remove those things like the dairy or the wheat and the gluten add them back in you'll get an idea how they actually impact you and it's i suggest it to people all the time you'd find you know you you might be allergic to eggs and you have no idea and you add them back in and you you see you might be a little more like um, phlegmy or it kind of, you know, that inflammatory response in your body. So I think it's very good in that aspect. 
to cut these things out and see how your body's actually meant to feel. And, you know, 30 days isn't brutal. It's tough. It does take a lot. Um, again, like I've obviously no connection to whole 30, so I hope I don't sound like I'm pushing it, but the idea of putting a focus onto real whole foods and, you know, getting the most natural things possible and eliminating all those things I think is really good. And again, to kind of maybe get cravings under control and to get your taste buds back up. Like when you, like you said, when you're eating junk food all the time, it's just, they, they're numb. You don't know what real food is anymore. And once you start eating some of these real good things, like I make these meals that I'll, I'll do a lot of time where I'll just do simple, like say sweet potato. I'll saute that in like a coconut oil with some um, chicken. I'll put in some, I'll toss it with like, you know, green onion and some cilantro and I'll throw in, you know, like real garlic and whatever. And then maybe a little like a bit of balsamic vinegar into it. And then, you know, a tiny little bit of hot sauce I mix in. To me, that stuff is junk food. It's that good that like I would order that in a restaurant happily because you, you just, you sort of liven your taste buds for real whole foods. And then those are the things you start craving. And so at its core, I think this whole thing is really good. It's just like, what are you going to do after the 30 days? Are you going to go back to your regular way of eating? If you were eating a lot of this stuff before and you're introducing it back in, ideally you would have, you would feel so much better on all these real foods that you just want to keep going on, going with them. And then, it, you know, obviously enjoying stuff whenever, of course, do that all the time. It's imp- not all the time, but you know what I mean? Like that is important and not to deprive yourself and have those cheat days here and there, you know, just don't let them get out of control. But you might find yourself, say you're like, you're craving, um, you know, you're eating so well during the week and then you're just craving I don't know, whatever it is, like a huge thing of pancakes and maple syrup and whipped cream, whatever it is. And then, you know, by the time when you get to it, you sometimes feel so crappy after that it's just not what you thought it was anymore. And I think that's one of the advantages of it or any of these elimination type things because you're not going to be depriving yourself. You're taking away like sugar, alcohol, grains, soy, dairy. You don't need those things per se, but the focus on those real things like good, ideally if you can get those good clean proteins and nuts and seeds and seafood and vegetables and fruits, like, I mean, the stuff you're made to eat. So that's, you know, of all these, there's a lot of different approaches out there. And for what's considered sort of a fad diet, I, I think it does have a lot of benefits to it. And I think it can help people. And I do, I honestly do like the approach. I like that elimination and then the reintroduction to give you an idea how your body responds to stuff. So I think I'll cut it off there. And hopefully that got you up to speed with everything and gave you a little more insight, whether you already had some or not into the whole thing. Um, you can check out, so it's whole30.com. If you want to see more, if you want to see the show notes for this episode, so like um, all the different stuff I talked about or links to, you know, whatever, it's regainwellness.com slash 146. So thanks for listening. Again, if you like the show, make sure to subscribe, share it if you like. And if you really like the show, you can do this thing supporting it and me, I guess, on a platform called Patreon. And that's where you basically kind of, you don't subscribe, but you contribute like a dollar to a month. And then that helps, you know, things with the show and keeping it going. It'll always be free, but it's just a way to kind of boost it and, you know, improve equipment or, you know, whatever like that. So if you want to see more about it, I won't go ramble too much, but it's, if you go to patreon.com slash wellness, that has my whole little page thing and you can check that all out. Okay. That's it for me. Hope you like the show. Hope you like the Webster intro and there'll be more of those coming up. Okay. See you later. Bye.